Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a few moments ago in Exodus chapter 6. We're looking at the covenant and the land, part number 4. The covenant and the land, part number 4. We find two of the nine covenants that are listed in the Old Testament. Two of them are mentioned for us here in verses 4 and 5. I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. That's the covenant of the land. Historically, it's been called the Palestinian covenant, but perhaps in light of what's happening in the Middle East today, better to call it the covenant of the land. And then in verse 5, God says, I have heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. That's the Abrahamic covenant covenant because he's going to tell them that he's bringing them back to the land as he had told Abraham in Genesis 17 that they would be in bondage for 400 years and then he was going to bring them back and put them in their own land. <clears throat> so of those nine covenants we've looked at three of them in somewhat of detail the Abrahamic covenant which we've studied in the past the covenant of the land which we're studying right now now and we looked uh, at an overview of the Mosaic Covenant, also known as the Law. And last week we showed how the transition from law to grace, and this is very important, how the transition from law to grace is essential in understanding God's plan for marriage in the New Testament. Paul says so. And we looked at that passage in Romans chapter 6 and 7, we're told specifically that we're not under the law but under grace in John 1.17 and Romans 6.14. But in Romans 7 he says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. That's stillbirth. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in oldness of the letter. And as we noted, those verses summarize for us why it's so important that we're no longer under the law. In fact, God gave the foundational institution of marriage to graphically illustrate why we're no longer under the law, according to Romans 7. That passage in Romans is essential to understand how the law and grace relate to marriage. How important it is to understand this, because there are some marriages that are based on law, some that are based on grace. Some that have law and force versus grace and love. And that's the point that Paul is making here in Romans chapter 7. It tells us that marriage and widowhood were given by God as an illustration to show why we're no longer under the law, which Paul portrays as our former husband, because death, and death alone, has removed the marriage bond. Therefore, we're free in the eyes of God to be married to our heavenly bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ. Whereas the law was sterile and barren and produced fruit unto death, that's the stillbirth, producing no living children, God's purpose for marriage, and Paul is using law and grace here to show that, God's purpose for marriage was to produce the fruit of life. Note that phrase in verse 4, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. As in a fertile marriage with physical children, that spiritual fruit of life is now possible, which it was not before under the law, but it is now possible in our new relationship with Christ by the living seed of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit who lives inside each and every believer. And that's why being in a divine love relationship with God is so much more powerful than merely slaving away under the law. And from that we learn two different things. Number one, love is always, no exceptions, love is always more powerful than law. God's love is always, and when we reflect it, is always more powerful than law. And secondly, love provides an overwhelming internal motivation rather than an external motivation force. 
God draws us gently, ever so gently and kindly with what the Bible calls bands of love. And we looked last week at Hosea 11.4, how God drew Israel to himself with bands of love. He drew them with cords of a man, with bands of love, and I was to them as they that take off the yoke on their jaws, and I laid meat unto them. He pulled on their heartstrings. Very important principle. Husbands and wives who learn this principle have happy marriages. Husbands and wives who try to force the relationship do not have happy marriages. You cannot force love. You cannot force submission. You cannot force obedience. Men need to learn that. You can force an unwanted physical relationship, but you cannot force love. You must win love. Love is won by kindness, by gentleness, by tenderness, by patience, by sacrifice. Love is won by long-suffering, by giving, by faith, by integrity, by consistency, by self-control. Love is won in quietness. Love isn't loud and pushy like the harlot of Proverbs chapter 5 and 7. Love is won by persistent love, unless that love is rejected. We saw that that passage in Hosea added two other things as well. God took off the yoke of their jaws. He removed the painful thing that bound them to their labor, the force that bound them to serve. In love, he gave them freedom. Very important principle of love. It expresses for us how God deals with us, how he dealt with Israel. He took the yoke off their jaw. Working and serving God because you're forced to do it never produces the same result as working and serving God because you love him. That's so hard for us to learn because we're so used to being forced to do everything we do. We have slothful natures and we don't like to do stuff, so our parents had to force us to do what they wanted us to do. Our teachers had to force us to do what they wanted us to do. Our boss has to force us to do what we, he wants us to do. And we are always under the threat of being fired if we don't do it. That's not the way love works. We gave you the illustration last week that force never produces the same results that working and serving God out of love produces. A husband who's required to work and serve long hours to pay alimony never does, never does, as much or with the same spirit as a husband who passionately loves his wife and children and who would do everything for them. Being forced by the law never brings joy it never brings thanksgiving, it never brings peace, it never brings willing service. But being truly in love with God always brings joy and thanksgiving and peace and gentleness and sacrifice and faithfulness and willing service. That makes a critical difference in two areas. First, it makes a critical difference in why we serve God and secondly, it makes a critical difference in how we serve God. The second thing in that passage in Hosea was that love always meets the genuine needs of the one who is loved. Love is not selfish. Love is sacrifice. And the second principle we learned about love in that passage was remember that most important principle of love, how to tell if something is lust or whether it is really love. Because love can always wait to give. Lust can never wait to get. Since we talked about love and force versus grace and love, we looked at God's description of real love in 1 Corinthians 13. And we saw four different kinds of love, four different words that are used. There's eros, erotic sexual love. There's phileo, friendship kind of love. There is stergo, which is family love. And there's agape, which is divine love. And the love that you see in 1 Corinthians 13 is agape. 
That's the deepest and richest and fullest and most meaningful and sacrificial love. And it should be the goal of every Christian in all of his relationships. We learn three things about it. Three words. Remember them. It's possible. <laughs> Say, oh, that's impossible. No, it's possible. God makes it possible. There is a special empowerment for it. Second word, empowered. And third word, motivated. There is a motivation to exercise this love that God has given. First, that kind of love is possible because we have received it from God. Second, that kind of love is a love that's been empowered by the Holy Spirit. And He makes it possible. And third, we have been motivated by this love because of the love that Christ had for us. And I commend to your attention for your own reading and meditation 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 1 through 8. Good passage to memorize. We talked about how it relates to the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5 because love is the very first of the nine uh, ninefold aspects of the fruit of the Spirit mentioned in Galatians chapter 5. We saw that agape is the kind of love that fills and enriches erotic love in the context of marriage alone. All other use of eros is illegitimate. Outside of marriage, it's cheap, plastic, counterfeit. Don't fall for it. It'll addict you like a drug and it's, it's unfaithful and it's, uncru and it's cruel and it's selfish. Second, we learned that agape deepens the love of friendship, phileo. It helps you really understand what is trust and companionship and understanding and oneness of thought and spirit and agreement of purpose and laboring together in a common task, helping another when the other one falls, sacrificing for your friends in time of need, never doubting that the friend has your back. Agape deepens friendship. Agape undergirds, deepens and enriches the love of family, stergo, that's natural affection like a mother has for her children. And that includes children both born and unborn. Natural affection is going to decline in the last days. We saw two prophetic passages dealing with that. Romans 131. It says, with these people in the last days are going to be without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection. That's ah, stergo, that's the negative form of stergo. Implacable, unmerciful. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy, the last letter that Paul wrote before his own martyrdom. He tells us that in the last days these people will be without natural affection. That's austergo. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. That first passage is in the context of nations that normalize sodomy. And it tells us in the last verse, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. That's God's judgment on the criminal offense in the divine standard of sodomy. Such things are worthy of death not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. You see, that is contrary to natural affection. That's an unnatural affection that men have perverted. That second verse there is also very prophetic and describes the end times. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. This is the last days, folks. We're living in it. And that's in the context of the persecution of Christians who are not politically correct. Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The reason Satan is so savagely attacked the family and that unit that God has given as a family is because it's a visible picture that God has given to show us the love relationship between Christ and his bride, the church, and the love that he as the father has for his children, husband, wife, children, the full complement of the divine family picture. Agape love is only possible for true Christians, but sadly we don't take advantage of it, I think, most of the time. Agape love is absolutely essential for a radically different family dynamic where the husband and father is patient, gentle, caring, extremely sacrificing, gentle leadership. He exercises a teaching ministry. It's a gentle protecting and providing authority exercised in love. 
It's a radically different family dynamic where the wife and mother is loving and willingly submits to and obeys her husband. Submission that does not have to be forced or demanded because it is a submission offered in love that shows how the church submits to Christ. It's a radically different family dynamic where there is a stable love between the parents that gives the children a perfect sense of security and belonging that gives the children discipline in love, that gives the children an example of consistent, holy life principles lived out in their presence by the parents. It's what's necessary to have your family and my family manifest the full range of God's love to us as his family. And so we closed the loop last week, all the other categories of love, eros, which is passionate love, phileo, which is friendship love, stergo, which is natural affection, all of those categories are designed by God as part of his plan for marriage. So do you understand why Paul is using that as an illustration to show us why we are not under law but under grace and why it is so much more powerful of a motivating force when we have a love relationship with God rather than merely a fear relationship with God. A Christian husband and wife should have true passionate love for one another and for none other. A husband and wife should be the best friends in the world. As for natural affection, the husband and wife will defend to the death one another and the children that God gives them. They'll sacrifice everything for the ones they love. Phileo is underpinned and fulfilled in agape God's plan for the church and that's why we're told to love one another because it shows the world what a difference being a Christian makes. Law and force versus love and grace in the context of marriage gives us insight into why the Bible tells us that we're not under the law but under grace. What a difference a relationship makes. What a difference a relationship makes. The law was a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ so that we would see the difference. Paul says it's a schoolmaster in Galatians chapter 5 verse 30, uh, 23 through 25. It was to teach us something but some people haven't learned. They still want to be under the schoolmaster. The law was a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ to show us the difference between force and love. So we continue with new material today in the Covenant and the Land, part four. Deuteronomy 30, verses one through 14, we've read it to you before. That's the principal covenant that we're studying in four parts. We learned six things already about it. Number one, it sets the conditions by which national Israel entered the Promised Land. Two, it set the conditions necessary for them to remain in the land. Number three, it set the conditions necessary to ultimately inherit the entire scope of the land from the Euphrates River on the east to the Nile River on the west. Four, it says that the land is an everlasting possession. Five, it guarantees that when Israel is expelled because of sin, God holds the land in escrow for them until he irresistibly draws them back to the land. And six, it guarantees that God will bring them back because Jehovah's covenants with Israel cannot be broken. Verse four of our text, I have established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. Three principles we've studied in the past that introduce us to our study today. When God makes principles related to the covenant of the land, we learn it's a prophetic covenant. Secondly, all God always fulfills prophecy literally. Third, because the promises to Israel are prophetic and fulfill literally, to deny them is to deny the inspiration of scripture. There are seven basic features to prophecy relate to the future of Israel seven basic features. If you're taking notes, I'll try to go slowly. Number one, first, that Israel would be a nation forever. And God made that as an unconditional promise. That Israel would be a nation forever. The church is not a nation. Israel is not the church. The church is not Israel. God made them a promise that they would be a nation forever. 
Genesis 17, 7 and 8 and 9 say, I will establish my covenant. This is the covenant God is cutting with Abraham in Genesis 17, where the Shekinah glory goes between the, the parts of the animals that Abraham has cut in half with their blood running down the center. I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. That's what's quoted in our text today in Exodus chapter 6 verse 4. And I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. That's restated again for us in the book of Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 35 through 37, God reveals through Jeremiah, Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinance of the moon and the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar, the Lord of hosts, Yahweh Sabaoth is his name, if those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus saith the Lord, if heaven can be measured, and if the foundations of the earth searched out, I will cast off all of the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. In other words, it is never going to happen. Romans chapter 11 is not only in the Old Testament, this is restated for us in the New Testament as well, in one of the principal doctrinal epistles of the New Testament. Romans chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. Paul writes and he says, I say then, Hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite. Now, he's not saying I am a spiritual Israelite because now I am part of the church. Uh, I'm spiritually connected to the covenant of Abraham. Paul was a physical descendant of Abraham. In fact, he knew which tribe he was part of. The next part he says, of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. This is not a spiritualized passage. This is, does not fit into amillennial covenant theology. Paul is emphasizing the fact that God has still a purpose and a plan and promises for Israel as a nation. Listen, he goes on. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. Wot ye not what the scripture saith of Elias? How he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets. This is not Israel the church. It isn't. They have killed thy prophets. They have digged down thine altars. And I am left alone, and they seek my life. That's Elijah back in the Old Testament. We're talking national Israel here. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. When you get discouraged, when you think you're the only one out there, when perhaps at work you're ridiculed and everybody gangs up on you and you're all alone, when you think that you really need the time for a pity party, you know, um, you know what this is. This is um, world's smallest violin playing world's saddest song. That's the way we feel about ourselves sometimes. When you begin to think like that, remember Elijah. He came for a pity party to God, and he had done a lot more for God than any of us have ever done. And he said, I am alone. I'm all by myself. God says, come on, cheer up, Elijah. Do you know I've got 7,000 men out there who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal, that have not compromised you look in, around you and you say, man, we're so alone, we're so small. What a tiny little group, we're all alone. Oh, feel sorry for us, Lord. God says, do you understand that I have 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal? You're not alone. And even if you were the only one on earth, you're on the winning side. You have the sovereign Lord of the universe who is in control of the very details, even the hairs on your head, and he is the victor. Or as God said to Moses, now you'll see what I'm going to do to Pharaoh. He thinks he's big stuff. Wait until I get through with him. Folks, that's the God that we serve. 
What saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time, there is also a remnant according to the election of grace. Who has he been talking about? He doesn't suddenly switch to allegorization. He doesn't suddenly switch to spiritualization. He has been talking about national Israel. He has reserved some for himself. The second principle that we learn about this landed covenant is it's a land forever. The ultimate fulfillment is totally unconditional. Although the Jews would be cast out of the land when they violated the law and turned after idols, God said it's an unconditional covenant and I've given you this land forever. That means it does not belong to anybody else. There may be squatters on the land at various periods of history and indeed there have been. Turks controlled it for 400 years, from 1517, the year that Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the door of the church in uh, Wittenberg, Germany, to 1917, when the Turks were driven out of the land. 400 years. Interesting. There was also a 400-year period that they were down in Egypt, if you recall. It belongs to Israel forever. Genesis 1517. It came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark. Behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp passed between those pieces. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt, that's the Nile, unto the great river, the river Euphrates. That's a large chunk of territory. It's had lots of squatters on it. It's had lots of the homeless, so to speak, living in the abandoned ruins, but it belongs by a perpetual eternal covenant to Israel. Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Folks, all of us are going to die. Doesn't matter how great we've been, how much we've done, how much we've accomplished, how many things we've owned, how much we've collected, how much we've hoarded, how much we've used for the flesh. We're all going to die. Moses was 120 years old when he died. I'd love to live to be 120 years old with the same strength and force and vigor that Moses had, but even Moses died. When Moses died, he was still as strong as he was when he was a young man. God took him. But folks, the end of all living is death. We live in a sin-cursed world. You and I are both closer to death than we were yesterday. I don't know how long I'm going to live. You don't know how long you're going to live. How much time do you have left? I mean, if you had to guess, how much time do you have left? What are you going to do with your time? It's the one thing you cannot get more of. You can get more money. You can get more houses. You can get more boats. You can get more stuff. But you can't get more life. What are you going to do with what remains of that tiny little shrinking bubble that vapor, as James calls it, that we call life, is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. If it doesn't count for eternity, you've just wasted the most valuable resource that you have. You'll never get it back. Moses my servant is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. This is a really cool verse, this next verse. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, I have given you as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness in this Lebanon, even under the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites. Do you know where the Hittites lived? That's ancient Turkey. 
huge amount of land that Israel's never held. Under the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall your coast be. There shall not be any man able to withstand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give to them. I don't know how much more plain you can get than that. God still has a purpose to give them the land, and it has not yet reached its full extent. That means it's coming because God always fulfills his covenants. God always keeps his promises. He does not break his promises. And remember, three times, the Bible promises that three times Israel would be cast out of the land as a nation. Three times they would be restored. They've already been cast out by Babylon, Assyria, and Rome, and two times they have been restored. And folks, the prophetic time clock is ticking because God is in the process of restoring Israel to its land today. First, that they would be cast out. This is in Jeremiah chapter 11, uh, chapter 25, starting in verse 11. This whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. And it shall come to pass when seventy years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans, and will make it perpetual desolations. And I will bring upon that land all my words which I have pronounced against it, even all that is written in the book which Jeremiah hath prophesied against all the nations. Jeremiah made prophecies concerning Israel. Jeremiah made prophecies concerning the nations. Jeremiah was not wishy-washy fuzzy in his prophecies. He said it would be exactly 70 years that they would serve the king of Babylon. And then he said, these are the things that are going to happen to Babylon. And he lists also a number of other nations where specific prophecies would happen. And that would be the way that they would know for sure that God fulfills his prophecies literally. You know what? Every one of those prophecies came true literally. That's the way God fulfills prophecy. He doesn't give these fuzzy oracles. He fulfills prophecy literally. Seventy years. We find in Deuteronomy chapter 28 that God also talked about casting them out of the land. Starting in verse 63, And it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught, and you shall be plucked from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. And the Lord will scatter thee among all people from the one end of the earth even unto the other. And if you know anything about the diasporas of the Jews, the scatterings of the Jews, you know that they have been scattered all over the earth. I have a Jewish friend who used to joke about it and say, you know, uh, uh, the Jews have even been scattered to the North Pole. And people would look at him sort of funny and they'd say, what do you mean? And say, well, haven't you heard of the icebergs? <laughs> but anyway, uh, all people from one end of the earth even unto the other, and there shall you serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known even wood and stone. But among those nations shalt thou find no ease. And they haven't. Every place they've gone, there's been persecution against the Jews. Neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. You've heard that phrase, the wandering Jew. But the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart and failing of eyes and sorrow of mind and thy life shall hang in doubt before thee and thou shalt be in fear day and night and thou shalt have none assurance of thy life. In the morning thou shalt say, Oh, would to God it were even. And at even thou shalt say, Would to God it were morning. For the fear of thine heart wherewith thou shalt fear and for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships by the way whereof I spake unto thee Thou shalt see it no more again, and there ye shall be sold into your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen. And you know you'll be so cheap that no man will buy you. Nobody want you. Was God serious about his promises to Israel and about their obligations to him? I think as you read this passage, you see that he's serious about it. Deuteronomy chapter 30, two chapters later, God says, 
Starting in verse 1, it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessings and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations, whether the Lord thy God hath driven thee, and shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee, and will turn and gather thee from all nations, whither the Lord thy God has scattered thee. If any of thine be driven out under the uttermost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee, and the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. God said, you obey me, and I'll keep you in the land. You disobey me, and you have never seen such a spanking in all of your life. I will drive you to every place on the face of the earth except the place of promise. But if you repent, if you turn again to me, if you seek me with all your heart, then I will irresistibly draw you. You know, back at the end of July, in the first part of August, when the beginning of all that conflict with all those something like 2,700 rockets were fired from Gaza into Israel and many of them toward Jerusalem, did you know that during that period of time, over 500 American Jews, during that time, 500 of them emigrated to Israel and claimed citizenship as Jews? Most of us would say, man, I sure would not move, want to move to a place like that during this kind of a conflict. It was during that time that they emigrated because they wanted to be there in the land. That's God doing what he's promised here, irresistibly drawing them back to the land. Because time is winding down. Those promises that Israel would be restored. Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 and 14, He said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve I will judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. That's written, or that occurred in approximately 2000 B.C., when God spoke that promise to Abraham. Israel went into Egypt, at about 1800 BC. God brought them out of Egypt in 1445 BC. They were there for 400 years exactly like God promised. And it was something that took place 200 years, that entrance into the land took place 200 years after God made the promise to Abraham. No guesswork here. There's a sovereign God in heaven who works all things according to the counsel of his own will, not according to our puny, foolish, petty plans. Daniel 9, verse 2. Here's Daniel reading the Old Testament that had been written up to that point. Not all the Old Testament had been written, because the book of Daniel is part of it, but he was reading the prophets who were written before he lived. And one of those prophets was Jeremiah. Now remember, we, we just read a moment ago what Jeremiah had said, that the whole land shall be in desolation and in astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years, 7-0, seven 70 years. Now we find in Daniel chapter 9, verse 2, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet. He's reading the book of Jeremiah that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Did Daniel believe in literal prophecy being fulfilled literally, accurately, historically, exactly like it was said it would be? You bet he did. And that's why Daniel set his face to fast and to pray 
that God will fulfill His word. You and I can do the same. You can always pray God's words back to Him. You can always say, God, I believe your word, and this is what I'm looking forward to because your word declares it to be true. It declares it to be so. And you are the living God who keeps promises. And I'm trusting in your word. I'm trusting in your promises. Listen, if you can't trust his literal promises, you can't trust your salvation. You can't trust that Jesus died and rose again. Understanding that principle makes a great deal of difference as to whether or not you are a Bible-believing Christian or a liberal. Whether or not you believe that God has a future plan for national Israel or doesn't. Whether or not the scripture is inspired or not. The word of God is a unit. It's not a collection of short stories by O. Henry and somebody else. It was given through many different men, many different prophets, at many different times of history, in many different contexts and circumstances, but it is the word of God. It came from Him. That's what we believe. And if you don't, woe to your soul. And it shall come to pass when seventy years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and will make it a perpetual desolation. And I will bring upon the land all my words which I pronounced against it, even all that's written in the book which Jeremiah hath prophesied against all the nations. Remember what we read there in Deuteronomy 30 a moment ago? Then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all nations whether the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. Jeremiah has more to say about it in chapter 23, eight chapters before, seven chapters before. Behold, the day is come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Now, those of you who have heard me preach in the past on that subject know who the righteous branch is. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Very clearly fulfilled in the New Testament, stated to be so. In his days, Judah shall be saved and all Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called Jehovah Sidtenu, the Lord of righteousness. Jesus Christ is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. His name will be Yahweh Sidtenu, the Lord our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, The Lord liveth, who brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but the Lord liveth, which brought us up, and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country, and from all countries where they have been driven, and they shall dwell in their own land. There's coming a day when Israel will not just look back to that time they were delivered from Egypt. There's coming a day when Israel as a nation will look back to that time when God brought them from all over the face of planet Earth and drew them to that tiny pinpoint which is the apple of God's eye to the land of Israel. And that's what they will remember. One thing to bring a group that's already a cohesive group about 200 miles. Another thing to bring them as scattered individuals from all over the globe and pull them together into one location. And the day will come when they will remember that, that that is what God has done. That's a powerful passage. Look at Ezekiel chapter 37. I know our time is almost up. Ezekiel 37, beginning in verse 21. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whether they are gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. Remember God said, I'm going to scatter you when you sin, and I'm going to bring you back, and it's going to happen three times. And three times they've been scattered, and twice they've been returned. And now we're looking at God beginning to draw the Jews from all over the world back to the land of Israel. I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whether they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. 
You see, they've been scattered. They haven't been one nation. But God views them as a nation. And God says, I'm going to make it again. I will make them one nation. And one king shall be king to them all, and they shall no more be two nations, neither shall it be divided into two kingdoms anymore. There is no longer to be Israel and Judah, as there was in the days of Rehoboam, the foolish son, who said, I'm going to be tougher than my father Solomon was. And so half the entire nation, in fact, the northern ten tribes, separated and got called Israel, and the southern two tribes are called Judah, Judah and Benjamin. You know, I didn't even have that kind of division anymore. You're not only going to be drawn from all the nations, but those two entities which used to be at war with one another, I'm going to meld them. I'm going to squeeze them together. I'm going to mold them into one. Does God keep his promises? Folks, these are very explicit, specific promises. Neither shall they defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor in their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions, but I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned. I will cleanse them so that they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they all shall have one shepherd they all shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein. This is not spiritualized. This is not allegory. They shall dwell therein, even they and their children, and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. David's dead. David was dead when this was written. That means that there's going to be a resurrection and David has a very specific, explicit responsibility in relation to Israel in the future. A risen David. We have the implication, of course, here of the resurrection as it's stated in many places of Scripture. Well, our time is up. We want to talk about repentance, the specific repentance that God requires for Israel to be fully restored to the land. But that will have to wait till next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you again for your word, for your great and precious promises. How we thank you that your word is true and that we can rely upon it, we can trust upon it, we can stand upon the word of God without fear, without faltering, without shaking, without wobbly. Help us, Father, to be those who are strong in the faith because we have the sword of the Spirit, the word of God. You are the true and living God, the eternal life-giving God the God of all flesh. And you are the God who has made a promise to Israel for the seed of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. You made a promise to them to give them a land. You promised them that when they sinned, you'd cast them out. You promised them that when they repented with all their heart and came back to you, that you'd restore them. And Father, we see that it's that cycle has happened two full times and we're looking now at the second half of the third cycle. It should give us encouragement. It should also give us warning that you're a God who expects us, your people, to with all of our heart and soul cling to you, to with love and faithfulness serve you, to rejoice that your promises to us are also true. They're not allegory. They are true promises. And they are things that we are looking forward to with great expectancy and joy. Father, we pray that you'll take your word as proclaimed this day, the truth of your word, penetrate our hearts, and cause us to walk by faith in the service of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we pray it in his name. Amen. Our closing hymn for this morning.